Life Science Learners to another installment on cell division. Today, we're focusing on a concept that we do in grade 10, mitosis. I'm sure you guys have experienced the concept of how cells grow and become more. Have you ever wondered how this happens? Today, we're going to try and unpack the process of how cells divide and produce more and the, co and the reasons why this happens. Let's try and unpack that in the context of the processes and where it occurs. So, when we look at cell division, it's important to understand how do organisms grow. If we try and understand that, it's important that we then look at the concept of how do organisms grow and increase in size. We all have started from a single cell stage where there was a process of fusion between the male gamete and the female gamete that come together and form a single cell. We then see that that cell divides, produces more cells, and becomes this multicellular organism. That is all happening through a process known as mitosis, cell division. So it's important that we look at the overview of today's lesson. So we're going to look at what it means to refer to a cell cycle. We're going to try and understand what is a process called interphase. And the, and, the, and the relationship to what chromosomes are. We're going to look at the purpose of mitosis. We're going to try and establish where mitosis occurs. And then we're going to look at the process of mitosis. So let's get straight into some important keywords. And I'll go through this, and I'll try and explain some of these now, and then as we get into the lesson. So we need to understand what mitosis is, and we're going to unpack that in the first few slides. We're going to refer to the cell cycle as what happens in the life cycle of a cell. We're going to try and understand what are chromosomes, and we're going to look at their arrangements in cell division, and what chromatids are as structures in chromosomes. We're also going to spend some time looking at what a centromere is in the context of the structure of a cell of a chromosome. Important to the process of cell division are different phases, and we're going to unpack these as interphase, prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase. We also need to look at concepts such as benign tumors, which are tumors that are showing specific characteristics, and malignant. We're going to need to describe the process of cell division consisting of two steps, cytokinesis, which is the cytoplasm, and kinesis is movement, so the movement or division of the cytoplasmic contents, and karyokinesis, where we refer to the movement or division of the nuclear material. So the kinesis is movement or division and of the nuclear material. We're also going to look at what a tumor is, and we're going to unpack when, what happens when cancer sets in. So let's try and understand what is the cell cycle. So the cell cycle starts when the cell forms and ends. As a mature cell, it divides into two daughter cells. Each cell has its own cycle. So we'll find that a cell will divide to form two cells, and each of these cells further divide and continue the process of cell division. So this process of cells dividing to form more is essentially cell division. However, each of these cells undergoes a specific cycle of events. And that's essentially what we refer to now as the cell cycle. So the cell cycle has three parts. The G1, or the gap one, the S phase, or the synthesis cycle, and then the G2 phase, or the gap two phase. So let's unpack these using this illustration. So on this illustration, we see the cycle in the life of a cell, and we see that it's divided broadly into three 
different components. As I mentioned, the first phase is called the G phase, or the G1 phase, which is also referred to as the interface. It is during this stage that the cell undergoes, undergoes growth and development. In the S phase, which is also part of the interface, the cell undergoes preparation for cell division, where it synthesizes more copies of the DNA. It will further continue growing into the growth phase, which is the G2 phase. Towards the end of the G2 phase, we find that it goes into what we call the phases of mitosis, where it undergoes mitotic cell division. And so that's going to be the focus of our lesson today, the process of cell division and how two daughter cells are formed in this process. So let's unpack what happens in each one of these phases in the cell cycle. The gap phase of the G1 phase is the phase in which the cell undergoes normal growth and cell functioning. And here it synthesizes all the proteins that are needed. The cell increases in size and volume as more cell organelles are produced. So after cells divide, it produces more organelles and it becomes much more complex. The cell can only move to the next phase, which is the S phase, after synthesizing enough of ribosomes. So it would have produced the organelles, the mitochondria, as well as the ribosomes, and now it is prepared for the next phase of synthesis, as I've indicated in this diagram here. Let's look at what happens further on in the gap phase. As the phase is almost done, the mitochondria of the cell fuses into a network of mitochondria for effective energy production for cell processes. If the cell cannot divide any further, it ends, and we say that it undergoes a G0 phase, which is essentially the end of that cell cycle. Let's look at what happens when that cell moves into the S phase or the interphase of synthesis. This is the phase when the cell synthesizes and doubles its DNA. We refer to that process as DNA replication. So interphase is identified with the ability of the cell to be able to copy DNA and produce copies of that through a process called DNA replication. And this is essentially doubling the amount of genetic information. Why is this important? Replication is key to ensuring that when two cells are formed, that each cell has the same genetic information as the parent cell from which they divided. Hence, it is important that in interphase, that DNA replication happens and that copies of DNA made so that both of these daughter cells are genetic replicas of the parent cell. And so DNA replication is fundamental to maintaining the genetic identity of the two cells that are produced. So, additionally, new packaged proteins known as histones are produced, and these wrap around the DNA copies to make it stable. And we will have to look at what this means in the next component where we discuss what a chromosome is. During the S phase, more phospholipids are produced. So these are complex proteins and fats put together, which make up the cell membrane and organelles that are needed in the next stage of the cell cycle. During this phase, the cell continues to grow and it prepares for cell division, which we refer to as mitosis. So the cell continues its growth and development in anticipation of mitosis. The mitochondria will divide and continue to grow until the start of mitosis. So you have more mitochondria being produced and they further develop. Also the plant Chloroplast also divides in this phase. So you find that there is organelle growth and development in the G2 phase. The interphase and chromosomes. So let's try and understand what chromosomes are and how these form. So if we go back to the structure of the cell, and if we think of the, the cell has a nucleus, the nucleus contains all the genetic information, which we know is DNA. And that is the blueprint of that cell. 
the DNA has to undergo a process of DNA replication, which essentially means that each strand of DNA is copied to form two new strands. And so from the original DNA strand, we get two more copies that are produced. And these copies are important in the next phase of cell division. So at the beginning of interphase, the cell grows quickly, more organelles are made, and there's an increase in the number of chemical reactions. Let's see what this means in terms of DNA replication. The cell becomes more specialized for its function in the body, and it may store nutrients and get ready for mitosis. Towards the end of interphase, we discussed this, the chromatin material now makes a copy of itself, which I've illustrated in this image here, showing you the process of DNA replication. The chromosome network coils up to make short chromosomes. So what happens is that we have DNA, which then starts to wrap itself into a compact structure. And these structures essentially are held together by a histone protein, and they form what we know as complex structures known as chromosomes. So this starts wrapping itself into a complex arrangement, which we often illustrate as that structure. So we often draw that as a structure where we have the chromatin wrapped around and connected in the middle. So at the end of interphase, each chromosome is composed of two identical strands because it has made up of a copy of itself. So as I indicated here, these two strands are copies of each other that are now compactly wrapped around histone proteins and held together in the middle. And we're going to unpack that structure in a bit. The two identical strands are called chromatids, and they are joined at one point by a structure called the centromere. So we have one chromatid, we have the other chromatid, which are held together by the centromere. So here we've got a chromatid, and here we've got the centromere, which is what holds the copies together. So these two are identical to each other, and they are basically DNA that is wrapped around histone proteins to form these structures. And this is, again, an illustration of what a chromosome looks like. And clearly here you're seeing the chromatin network that's wrapped around histone proteins, which are not visible in this diagram, and are held together by the centromere. So here's the one chromatid. Here's the other chromatid, which are then held together by the central centromere. And that can be illustrated in a more simplified diagram as I've illustrated here. So here we've got one of the chromatids, the copy of the other chromatid held together by the centromere, and this forms one chromosome. For every chromosome in a somatic cell or a body cell, we've got a pair of them. So we refer to these as a homologous, and I'll unpack that word, pair of chromosomes. The word homo means similar, and logos refers to the position of the genes on these chromosomes. So we have collectively, in a normal haploid, diploid human cell, we've got 46 chromosomes in all our somatic cells. So what do somatic cells refer to? All cells except the egg and sperm. So the egg and sperm are your gametes, which each have 23 chromosomes each. So every cell in the body, excluding the egg and sperm, have 46 chromosomes. So essentially, this, there would be 46 of these chromosomes in a somatic cell. So guys, we've looked at the structure of a chromosome. We've kind of identified that a chromosome is made up of chromatids, which are held together with the centromere. And this is essentially the arrangement of the DNA in readiness or preparing for cell division. 
It's important that the chromatin is arranged in a compact, systematic way. And this ensures that when the process of dividing the nuclear material occurs, that it can occur in a systematic and organized method. So guys, you guys deserve a break. We've looked at the structure of a chromosome. When we get back in the next segment, we're going to look at the process of mitosis. Thank you for staying tuned. See you in after the break. Welcome back, life science learners. In this segment, we're going to continue with mitosis, but let's look at the process of mitosis in this segment and try and unpack how this actually occurs. So before we got into the break, we looked at the structure of chromosomes and we tried to understand what was present in a chromosome. We unpacked the word chromatids and how these are connected together by the centromere. Let's look at the purpose of mitosis. It's important that we understand why it occurs and also where it occurs. So let's unpack that now. The purpose of mitosis. Let's look at what the purposes are. So there are three distinct reasons why mitosis happens. The first reason is for growth, and that's obviously for organisms to be able to grow and multiply in size and numbers. It's also to repair and repair damaged tissue. We also know that during a process of reproduction, that asexual reproduction involves mitosis. So asexual reproduction involves a single organism producing copies of itself. And that would mean that this would have to take place through mitosis. So clearly, the role of mitosis is important not just for growth, but also in terms of for the production of more individuals. And that happens through asexual reproduction. So let's try and understand how mitosis happens in growth. So we know that in multicellular organisms, they need cell division to grow as they all start from a single cell soon after uh, fertilization, they will divide to form a large number of cells. And we discussed that an egg and a sperm will fertilize to form a zygote. And that zygote undergoes cell division to become a blastocyst or this multicellular organelle, which eventually grows up or divides and grows into a huge number of cells, which becomes multicellular. So important for growth. Repair as being an important process of, my, of growth and development. Organisms constantly need to repair and renew themselves. Worn out tissue or dead cells are replaced through cell division. We know that we constantly lose our skin cells. We might experience injury and, and, and damage to tissues that are repaired through a process called mitosis. And hence, it's important for growth and development of an organism. Reproduction as being the third reason. We know that single cell organisms such as bacteria and protista can basically reproduce by cell division where, they, where a single cell divides and forms two new cells. And that process is called binary fission or budding where they develop and break away to grow into an entire new organism simply by dividing and producing more cells. Let's try and understand where does mitosis take place. So in plants, mitosis takes place in the apical parts, that means on the tip of the plant as well as in the root tip. So we find that a plant can grow vertically up as well as vertically into the ground. And at these tips of the parts, which we refer to as the apical parts, there is meristematic tissue, which is tissue that divides and constantly allows for the plant to grow vertically as well as uh, vertically as well as horizontally so we refer to those as being the buds that are present on the lateral meristem which allows for the plants to grow in girth or in width so that is the meristematic tissue present underneath the bark which allows for the plant to grow in width as well as in height we also know that in animals, it happens in specific places in organs like the bone marrow cells, as well as the skin basal layers, which we see as being continuously produced. Some tissues are produced continuously 
being replaced by mitosis. Classical example is that of the skin. We also know that animals molt and they shred off the external body covering. That again is an example of mitosis which constantly happens which allows for growth and development. Examples of these would include the epithelial tissue as well as the connective tissue that we see. So that's bone, blood cells, etc. So let's look at how the process of mitosis takes place. So we can look at the different stages of mitosis in an animal cell as well as a plant cell. So there are two division processes that are important in mitosis. The first process is called karyokinesis, and the second process of that is called cytokinesis. Karyo refers to the nuclear material, so this is the division of the nucleus, and cytokinesis refers to the division of the cytoplasm. So we see that this nucleus needs to divide, as well as the cytoplasm needs to divide. To make it easier to describe, we divide mitosis into four phases. And the four phases that are present are called prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase. However, I have mentioned the phase interphase already. And this essentially refers to the phase that prepares the cell for cell division. And this is where DNA replication has occurred. So we have interphase followed by the four different stages or phases of cell division. We often use the mnemonic IPMAT to describe the sequence. Again, this will help you to remember the sequence where P refers to prophase, the first phase, M, metaphase, the second phase, A, anaphase, the third, and T, telophase, the fourth phase of mitosis. Let's try and unpack and recollect what happened in interphase. So cells may appear inactive during this phase, but they are quite the opposite. What happens is that this is the longest phase of the cell cycle, during which an important process called DNA replication occurs, where copies of DNAs are made. Also important are organelles called centrioles, which are important to controlling the process. These divide, and proteins are actively produced. And this is all in preparation for the next phase. So this is a cell that shows you a cell present in interphase where you clearly see the nucleus and a dense duplicated copy of the DNA. So the DNA has undergone copying and we see that illustrated here. And this again is the doubling of the DNA in anticipation of the next phase. So these cells indicate a dense network of chromatin which has undergone copying or production of more DNA. Right, so let's look at the next phase, which is prophase. This is the first phase of the actual process of mitosis. So in prophase, the first phase, it is made up of two separate centers. So the centrosome, sorry, my bad, is made up of two separate centrioles. So we find that the centrosome will then split up into two separate centrioles, and these will move to the opposite ends of the cell. And from these, we find the development of structures called spindle fibers. So we see the centrioles is moving to the opposite poles and fibers from these opposite ends developing. The centrosomes then move to the opposite poles of a cell. So if I were to illustrate a cell here, we'll find that there's the migration of these to the opposite poles where they eventually lie the opposite ends and from which the development of spindle fibers occur. And these spindle fibers are cytoplasmic threads that connect the opposite centrosomes to each other. Each chromosome is visible as two chromatids joined by the centromere. And in this, you find that you now have the presence of chromosomes which have begun to appear with a chromatid uh, being held together by the central centromere. Let's look at a cell as it would appear in prophase. So clearly, 
you can see the development of compact structures called chromosomes. We see the central centrosome splitting and moving to the opposite poles, and we see the presence of structures developing called centromeres, uh, sorry, called spindle fibers. So these spindle fibers develop and they move to the opposite poles of the cells, forming these cytoplasmic threads. Here's an illustration of an electron micrograph showing you the movement and the presence of chromatids and how these, here you can clearly see the centrosomes moving to the opposite poles with a dense concentration of the chromatin now arranged as centro, as sorry, as chromatids held together. So the DNA starts wrapping itself and then starts presenting themselves as these chromosomes right in the center of the cell. As we move on to metaphase, let's try and understand what happens here. So in metaphase, the nuclear membrane has disintegrated. We find that the outer membrane has disappeared. The chromosomes now line up at the equator. And I often use the word meet to remind me of what is happening. So we find that in the middle of the cell, along this imaginary equator, the chromosomes tend to line up and meet at a point on the middle. So we refer to that as a process of where the chromosomes now have lined up at the equator of the cell. Each chromosome becomes attached to the separate spindle fibers and start to move towards the equator. So we find that the spindle fibers have formed and these start arranging themselves with the chromosomes attached along them in the middle of the cell. Let's look at what this means in terms of an illustration. So here we see this imaginary equator where we see that the chromosomes have now arranged themselves along the equator with the spindle fibers attaching to each chromatid. So these chromatids are then attached by the spindle fiber to the opposite ends. Again, unique to this stage is the characteristic of the chromosomes being arranged along the middle. So again, meeting along the middle of the cell. Here's an electron micrograph illustrating the dense concentration of the chromosomes along the center of the cell. And you can see faint images or lines of the spindle fibers emerging from the, from the centrioles at the poles. So this is essentially a cell that you can see has now been, been in the process of meeting or arranging the chromosomes along the equator. As we get into the next phase, which is anaphase, we need to understand the context of what happens. So each chromosome now begins to separate into its sister chromatids. The sister chromatids essentially would be, we recap the structure of the chromosome, so that's the centromere, and these chromatids are going to be pulled to the opposite ends. So the centromere splits, separating or pulling the daughter chromatids to the opposite poles. So we find that each chromosome separates into its sister chromatids by the action of the spindle fibers pulling, separating the spindles at, towards the poles. Each of these chromatids, now called the daughter chroma chromosomes, is pulled to the opposite poles. So as we see this in the next slide, we will see that that's the central equator, but we now see that this, I'm going to illustrate this chromatid chromosome would have split it up, and you'll find that the chromatid now is being pulled to one end, and its daughter chromatid is now pulled to the opposite ends. And this happens by the spindle fibers contracting and splitting up a chromosome into its chromatids, which are then pulled apart. Again, use the A to remind you of apart. And this is the splitting of the chromatids moving apart. And these are pulled then to the opposite poles at the ends of the cell. We can clearly see that in this image, that there is a hollow or a dense 
a, a, a kind of a lighter distribution along the middle, but we see that there is a movement of the chromatids towards the opposite poles. Finally, we now see that these chromosomes have moved into the next phase, which is called the telophase, where we see how the chromosomes start to arrange themselves along the equate and along the poles of these cells. What is important at this process, at this stage, is a process called cytokinesis occurs, which essentially points to the division of the cytoplasm from the center of the cell. So cytokinesis starts by the cell membrane starting to constrict at the equator of the cell. So we find that now the cytoplasm starts to constrict and separate out into two new cells. And we will see that this will result in a cell that now separates, forming two new cells by the constriction of the cytoplasm. And that is, is but the constriction of, sorry, of the cell membrane causing the separation of the cytoplasm. And that process is called cytokinesis. We'll find that the nuclear membrane and the nucleolus start to form around each daughter cell. So we see the presence of the nuclear membrane forming with the nucleolus reappearing. Each of the daughter cells now has the same number of chromosomes as the parent cell. So this image essentially shows you how the cytoplasm starts pinching away from the equator, causing the separation of the cytoplasm, eventually resulting in two separate cells. The development of the nuclear membrane occurs around these chromatids to eventually form two new cells having the same number of chromosomes. In this case, we call them daughter chromatids as the original cell. And that is essentially how the process of telophase wraps up mitosis. We also see in this image the appearance of what we call a cell dividing by the cytoplasm, the appearance of the nuclear membrane with the dense concentration of the chromatids towards each of the poles of the cell. And this wraps up how the process of mitosis takes place. So guys, we're going to break for a little while. When we come back, I'd like to share with you an animation of how this process happens through the process of division from the start of interface all the way to how they divide to form two new independent cells that are now having the same number of chromosomes. You guys have done well. Hang in there, have a little break, and I'll see you in a bit. Welcome back, life science learners, to our final segment on mitosis. In this segment, we're going to try and look at an interactive website where we actually see the process of how this occurs. I think it's important that we understand how this flows. Often we tend to think of mitosis as phases that occur as each process. However, it is an interconnected flowing process. And I think this will help us to be able to see how the process occurs. To make it easier, we often discuss each process and we identify the characteristics. But often this is a movie. This is a series of events that flows. And hence, let's try and understand how this happens in the context of, an, of the process using an interactive slide. So I'm going to go through this and I'm going to explain to you exactly what is happening. So currently on the slide, you can clearly see that we've showed a, a phase of interface where the cell is actually undergoing has undergone DNA replication. And I think it's important that you look in the far uh, top left-hand corner where you see the image and in, in, in kind of in situ, which is under a microscope. And then the largest scope of this image is a graphical illustration of that. So let's move from interphase into prophase. And in prophase, we can see that the centrioles have split and moved to the opposite poles. We're seeing the presence of uh, spindle fibers developing, but we're also looking at the diagram illustrating the copying of DNA, where the DNA is now copied and the presence of chromatids being held together by those yellow chrom uh, centromeres in the middle. Prometaphase is essentially 
the transition from prophase into metaphase. And here we see how the chromatids uh, kind of have now moved towards being attached by the spindle fibers. We also see that the centrosomes have moved to the opposite poles with the well-developed spindle fibers running from one pole to the opposite end. If we move on to metaphase, we can clearly see now the development of the spindle fibers from one end to the opposite end with the chromosomes, as I mentioned, meeting along this imaginary equator at the middle of the cell. Clearly, with the yellow dots, which are the centromeres being attached to the spindle fibers. If we move from metaphase, we get on to the next phase, showing you anaphase. And anaphase would indicate the separation of the chromatids being pulled apart by the spindle fibers contracting. We see that the yellow dots, which indicate the centromeres, have split and have been moved apart. So what we see is that single chromatids, called daughter chromosomes, are now moving to the opposite poles. In the last phase, we see telophase where the cytoplasm has extended. We can see towards the middle the process of cytokinesis starting to occur. And I'm going to click on cytokinesis, and where we see now the cytoplasm being split along the middle into separate new cells, the nucleus now reappearing with the membrane around the chromatids. And we see that the cell now prepares for interphase as the next cycle of the cell. So I'm going to play all of this as one continuous uh, slide, and I want you to watch the events as how these unfold. And I'll pause them at different phases to show you how this occurs. So pay attention, look at the process of how this occurs, and watch how it occurs. So again, very quickly, you're seeing the division. OK, I'll play this one more time, and I'll pause it for us. So that's, again, we're seeing the division from prophase into late, or into late prophase, where now it prepares for the chromosomes meeting along the equator. We see them now moving into position at the equator, preparing to meet. We then see that now anaphase has taken place where the chromatids, I'll rewind that, has, if we play that very carefully, you can clearly see how the chromatids are splitting, and we see them now moving apart, moving to the opposite poles. And as we play this by a frame, we can see the cytoplasm in the middle moving and beginning to separate. We find that at telophase now, the nuclear membrane reappears. We see the cytoplasm in the middle moving apart and splitting. And now we see the separation of the cells. And that's essentially how this process occurs in a continuum of events. Let's get to the application of what happens when cell division goes wrong. And we refer to uncontrolled cell division, often leading to a process where we have cancer developing. The cell cycle is controlled by signals, and the body cells divide between 20 to 50 times and then get old and die. And that process of cell death is called apoptosis. And there are several factors that control this, which scientists are trying to understand. However, some cells ignore the signals and carry on dividing to form a mass of cells. So we say that the division is uncontrolled. And this often becomes cancerous. So uncontrolled cell division leading to a mass of cells forming tumors. They cause different cancers depending on where their cancer is. Cancer is dangerous because it can spread and help and attack other healthy organs and tissues. Let's see why this occurs. There are two major types of tumors that develop, a benign tumor and a malignant tumor. Let's try and understand what these mean. So I'll go back to benign and malignant. If we now focus on what each of these mean. So a benign tumor is a cell mass that stays at one site and does not spread. So we say that the benign tumor is localized, meaning that it is found in one area and has not yet spread. However, we will compare that to malignant in a little while. Here we see the development of a benign tumor that is localized in a specific area. These are generally 
cells that have continued to grow uncontrollably that can easily be removed and stopped from spreading. However, when we look at malignant tumors, we can see that these are cancerous cells that divide and leave their first site and they invade or spread to other organs and tissues in that process. And that process is called metastasis. And essentially, it is referring to the spreading of cancerous cells into other healthy areas where they begin to invade and grow and form more tumors. And in this image, we clearly see how this tumor has developed and has spread and has now invaded blood vessels and where these cells are carried in the blood capillaries and vessels and spread to other healthy areas. This image shows you a comparison between what happens as the cells become, grow and divide uncontrollable from being a benign tumor to becoming a malignant tumor. So as we look at the tumor here, it is an indication that it is localized in a specific area in the basal layer of the skin. But we eventually see that once these spread, they become malignant and they invade and pass on into blood capillaries. These will then travel and travel to other areas where they stick into the blood vessels and often invade other healthy tissue. This process where they spread and help and affect other healthy tissue is called metastasis. And now we're seeing the process being spread from cells in the basal layer of skin to all the way in the liver. And this is what we refer to as metastasis. Right, so we've looked at the concepts. Let's try and understand and apply our understanding to a few questions. DNA replication takes place during this stage in the cell cycle. And I'm going to read the options and then we're going to try and figure this out. The death phase, which we've not come across. Interphase, which we've discussed. Prophase and cytokinesis. Remember that cytokinesis refers to the division of the cytoplasm, so that's not the phase that we need to consider. So let's try and under, unpack that. So we have two options that clearly point to um, the process. So DNA replication, again, remember, occurs in a phase called interphase. So the correct answer here is interphase. Let's move on to the next multiple choice question. Chromatin network untangles, chromosomes condense, and the chromatids become visible. So this is describing a series of events that occurs in a particular stage. What is important is us, for us to understand what the context of this information is providing or leading to. So chromatin network untangles. Chromosomes condense and chromatids become visible. Now, if we kind of connect the three concepts together, it's not an interface because that's when DNA replication occurs. Metaphase is when is identified by the meeting of the chromosomes along the equator. Cytokinesis is the division of the cytoplasm towards the end of telophase. However, these descriptions clearly point to prophase. And that's when we see the chromosomes becoming distinctly condensed and visible. So the correct answer here is D. Let's attempt a few more as we get through. If a human cell starts the process of mitosis with 46 chromosomes, which I've pointed to earlier on, and then divides into two cells, each cell at the end of mitosis has, let's try and unpack this before we look at the options. So every cell in the body has 46 chromosomes, or we sometimes refer to them as 23 pairs. And we say that a somatic cell is a cell that has 46 chromosomes. This means that when a cell divides by mitosis, each of the cells should have the same number of chromosomes. So we refer to this as the cells being genetically identical. So if we look at our options, that's each of the cells will have 23 chromosomes. That's incorrect. 46 chromosomes, most likely correct. But it's important that we read the rest of the options. 92 chromosomes, definitely not. 44 chromosomes, certainly not. 
And so the correct answer here is 46. And again, this points to how the cells at the end are genetically identical to the cell from which they originally formed. Okay, so I've got a few more questions, but I'd like to jump onto the next question. The diagram on the next slide shows various cells undergoing different stages of cell division. Let's study the diagram and answer some questions based on this. So in this illustration, we're seeing cells undergoing various stages of cell division. And this is an electron microscope that has the cells stained out, showing you detailed images of the condensed network of DNA or chromatids in the center of the cell. So this question points to identifying different structures or phases. So the first question reads, identify whether the cell division in the diagram is occurring in a plant or animal cells. And we've got to give a reason for your answer. As we look at this illustration, it is important for us to recognize that in a plant cell, during cell division, we find that the cell will form, at the end of telophase, form a cell plate. And that is a distinct cytoplasmic membrane that forms between the two, separating the two cells. However, in an animal cell, which we saw, we saw that cytokinesis occurs, which eventually causes the separation of the cells by the, the cytoplasm pinching apart in the middle, forming two separate cells. And clearly, the cell plate in this cell is an indication that this is an, a plant cell. So the answer to this question would be that it is a plant cell and it's the presence of that cell plate. Identify four different mitotic stages in the diagram. As we wrap this section up, it's important that we're able to identify the different cells in a composite diagram showing these various phases. Right in the middle, we can clearly see a cell now showing a dense connection of cytoplasm. And that cytoplasm is in the periphery of the cell, but we're seeing the chromatin network now condensed into structures which we refer to as chromatids. So that cell in the middle points to the cell undergoing prophase. However, we can see cells in the phase of metaphase here where the chromosomes have arranged themselves along what we call the equator. So you can clearly see the spindle fibers towards the ends and you can see a dense network along this imaginary equator. We also can identify anaphase where the chromosomes are being pulled into chromatids at the opposite poles. So here we clearly see the movement of these chromatids to the opposite poles. Not as distinct as the diagrams that we've drawn, but clearly a movement to the opposite poles. And that identifies anaphase correctly. Guys, that's a wrap for today. We've looked at the different phases of mitosis. We need to now end the session. Thank you for staying tuned. I hope you've enjoyed the session. Review your concepts on mitosis and see you soon. Take care. Cheers. Bye.